Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Uh, open your Bible to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to talk about this one, over being overcomers. How to triumph in life. Glory to God. You know there's a, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of uh, pressure on life. There's a lot coming against people. Uh, people are dealing with stuff that they, you know, that just makes life difficult sometimes. And um, you've got to know how to win. I said, you've got to know how to win. You can't live life defeated. Now, anybody can live life defeated, but, because it takes no effort to live life defeated. But we, we are believers. We were not born to be defeated. We were born to live. We were born to live victorious. We were born to be overcomers, glory to God. Can you say Amen. Hallelujah. First John chapter 5. We'll start over here in um, verse 4. Hallelujah. And it says here, actually let's read verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him and that begat him loveth him also that is begotten of him. How many in this room this morning are believers? I got most of your hands. How many are believing believers? Now, I've met some unbelieving believers. You ever met them? They don't believe nothing. God don't do that no more. God doesn't do this. God doesn't do that. You know, God, you know, the only thing God's doing to you is defeating you, crushing you, destroying you, bringing you down. I mean, you know, life is tough. You know, that, that, them unbelieving believers. They just don't believe nothing. You know, what the, you believe the Bible. Yeah, but I believe none of that stuff in there for us to do. I don't know if came to church one day. And he came in, the pastor went down, and all he saw was the cover to a Bible. And he said, honey, what happened to your Bible? She said, oh, pastor, every time you said something wasn't for us today, I just tore those pages out. And she said, I expect to lose the cover this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you here? So people, people are always unbelieving believers. Well, we're believing believers, aren't we? We believe God will do what he said he would do. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. Then let's jump down to verse 4. It says here, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, we just asked you a minute ago, do you believe Jesus is the Lord? Are you a believer? And so if you're born of God, you are born to overcome. Well, I've experienced nothing but defeat, but that's not what you're born for. Are you here? See, some people are living in defeat because they don't know how to get to victory. It's a shame to have victory in you and not know how to use it. You shouldn't be living in defeat. Say, I should not ever be living in defeat. I should always be living in victory. Why? Because you're born that way. Hello? Now, have you ever noticed um, and, and we, we look at where people are born, how they're born. Now, a number of years ago, um, Van Crouch, you know, he, we were he had been he was at the church, and I was um, uh, we were out eating, and he said, you know, he said, and he gave me some statistic, and it's crazy statistic at that time. Now, some things have happened since then. He said, he said, X number of percent of NBA players players retire bankrupt, and so you know, we well, we question why. Well, see. When, when you, you have a background of defeat, where a lot of these kids were coming out of places where it wasn't good, you know, when they got to the NBA and they got millions of dollars, they never changed who they were. They had the money, but they would go spend. And then, of course, you, you had um, agents who blood sucked them dry, and so they had nothing. Oh, yeah, you can have this. You can. Their, their mindset of who they were never changed. They only elevated the way they live to match the money they have. Okay? They met, so now Michael Jordan and some other guys like that came along and began to mentor these young kids. And so when they came up and they began to grow up, they began to mentor them, saying, "Listen, you got here's what you got to do with your money. You got to invest. You got to do this." And, and now that's not that figure has come down because you had people step up to the plate and mentor these young kids. But before that, they weren't getting that, and they were simply living at a higher level of who they were or how they were brought up. 
You know? You just live, they, live, they live day to day, and they begin to live day to day with millions of dollars. Okay? And then, then you get the people like the Kennedy group. They, they don't own nothing. They just live off the estate. And so they just live a lascivious lifestyle all the time because that's how they always live. And they, 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 they believe they're entitled to it because they've grown up all their life with the estate at Martha Vineyard and this money here and they're just living off the interest off the estate and they get to fly on the jet. It's, it's just their, their mindset is this is how I live. Okay? Now, for, the, for us as believers in the world, as Christians in the world, we were brought up, we were brought up in, in, in Satan's kingdom. We were brought up in the fetus mindset. We were brought up that, that God was sovereign, God was doing stuff to us, and God was mad with us, and da 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 And at some point in time, we got saved for whatever reason, you know, we, God was able to get to us, and we gave our heart to the Lord. But if you do not change how you think about who you are now that you are a believer, you can be a believer and live defeated. E.W. Kenyon said in his writings one time, I was reading this, he said, A believer that does not renew their mind to the Word of God will imitate a sinner. Why? Because that's how they grew up. They grew up a sinner. They grew up defeated. They grew up under the bondage of Satan. Yet the Bible tells us here that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. See, when you got born again, when Jesus came into your heart, when there was a transformation of your human spirit from death unto life, you now have the ability, you're born to be a winner. You're born, uh, in a, in, you're born into a family that has no lack, no, no lack of supply, no lack of, of ability to get you where you need to be, no shortage of anything to make you the head, not the tail. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy says that if you'll do what God said, you'll be the head, not the tail, above only, not beneath. You'll be blessed coming in, blessed going out, blessed when you're in the city, blessed when you're in the country, blessed when you lie down, blessed when you rise up. And how many have had days where you didn't feel any blessing at all? You think, let me go lay down because I don't feel blessed. You got in the bed and you covered your head up because you didn't feel blessed. Then you move down to the bonus room and you, and you, want, you just stuck your head in the couch because you didn't feel blessed. That is not the nature of the believer. That's not how we're supposed to be. We are born to be overcomers. Say, I am born to be an overcomer. Hallelujah. And so he says here, here in First John 5, he says, Whatsoever is born, if you're born of God, overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. In case you're wondering, that's where our church name came from. Faith and Victory Church came out of this verse right here. All right? Yeah. Our faith produces victory. Amen? Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But... He that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The only believers are born to win. That would ever be. Believers are born to win. Well, what about the people winning? They don't you worry about it. See, we're, we're walking in light of eternity. And we get the place where we win. Amen. We are born, we are, we are designed, it is our nature to win. Um, look, at first, uh, look at Psalm 41, verse 11. Very interesting statement here. Psalm 41, verse 11. By this, I know that thou favorest me. How, what is it? How does the psalmist know that God favors him? Because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. Oh, Pastor, let me, let me, can I say this now? We're word of faith, charismatic, you know, and we, we I mean, sometimes people say stuff we pull out and we, we cast the devil out of them and put the confession deeper on them and all this kind of stuff. I grew up in the midst of Brother Bill, too. Brother Bill was worse than I was. Anyway, we were crazy mad. We weren't just charismatic. We were crazy mad. I mean, if you said something negative, I wouldn't have said that if I were you. Come out, you ugly, you negative confession, double. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Ran, most, ran so many people off. They thought we were nuts. We were. We were crazy. <laughs> all right? Hallelujah. Anyway, um, how did I get up on that, Brother Bill? Just, uh, Brother Bill was a squirrel. No, no, we were all squirrels. Yeah, we all got better. We grew up and got better. Right, we're, we're no longer crazy man. We're, 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 we settled down a little bit. You know? We had crazy man, cruising man. They went to church to church looking for the, the whatever. But, oh, I was going to say, as, as word of faith people, we, we always we can't ever say something. We can't even address an issue because it's negative. 
The fact is, we have to address issues to help people grow. Amen. I said, Amen. You know, he says here, Thou favorest me, because you will not let my enemy triumph over me. Folks, we got enemies out there who are working against us. And this is, this is where I was going with all that. Even if Satan kills you, are you listening to me? We still win. Now, that's not, that's not what we want. We don't want to, we don't want to leave early. We don't want to be defeated early. But I am telling you, even in death, we're, we're victorious. O oh, death, where is thy victory? O oh, grave, where is thy sting? I've already got this back with the you know, that's the, There you go. There's no, for the Christian, even death doesn't have uh, victory over him. Why? Because the Apostle Paul said to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, which is far greater. Settle that. Dad Hagen used to say this. He said, you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. And once you're settled about the fact that when you die, you go to be with the Lord, if you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord, when you get that settled, well, glory to God, life can be a breeze. I'm not even going to try to sing that song. Okay? I, I, I just messed it up. And you, you were sitting there thinking about how's that supposed to go the rest of the service, and I'm not going to do that to you. Once we settle that, then we can go ahead and live. So I say Amen. Yeah, you know, I know you're thinking of it as a confession. So I say, now stop. Paul said to be present with the Lord's far greater. So that means that even if you think what you is a losing situation where death wins, death didn't win. Because you're with the Lord. That's right. So we're, we're victorious even in death. Now, I'm not trying to preach you into the grave early. But what I'm trying to let you understand is that the worst thing Satan could do to anyone is kill them, and that's still victorious for the Christian. We just we're, we're just victorious. Now, now listen, I don't believe that being your ultimate healing. I don't believe that you know that's the Lord's way of getting you healed. I don't believe any of that stuff. That's not Bible. But what I am saying is we must settle once and for all that even if Satan got the best of the upper hand and we home, went, we left the body, we still win. So we're just designed to win. See, we're designed to win. Now, I'm not planning on anybody leaving the other. I'm planning on everybody getting a hold of it, getting faith, winning, praise God, at, at, at life, and, you know, overcoming everything. But you know what? If you settle that other issue, then you can just go ahead and live in peace. Amen. Can I get these two grunts? Can I get a thank you, Jesus, or something? All right. Hallelujah. So, I know that thou favorest me because thy mind enemy doth not triumph over me. As a believer, there is no way Satan can triumph over you. He does not win no matter what happens. As the believer, I said as the believer, we are the winners. We're the head and not the tail. We are the head and not the tail. We are above only and not beneath. Yeah, amen? We're blessed everywhere we go. You may not feel like it, but you're blessed. Now, I'm going to start acting like a little, little bit more Pentecostal. This is not the first church of the frozen chosen. Amen. Why do we overcome? Well, first of all, look at John 16, 33. John 16, not, not first time, but obviously 16. It wouldn't be, it couldn't be. All three of the Johns put together don't make up 16, all right? The Gospel of John, chapter 16. Looking down here in um, verse 31, Jesus answered and said, Do you, do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that you might have peace. And some of you talking about that, you know, uh, he's leaving, they can be had tribulation, all this kind of stuff. In the world, you'll have tribulation. How I many have you ever had tribulation? But Jesus said, I speak stuff to you that you'll have peace. Well, how can I have peace in tribulation? Because we're not earthly minded. We're heavenly minded. We're not limited to the earthly resources. We've got heavenly resources. Glory to God. Why can we just, in the world, you'll have tribulation? But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Woo! Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Hallelujah. We don't have to be concerned. You know, this, oh, yeah, the world. 
I mean, they, well, I'm not going to say what you say, uh, my parents used to say, but going to Hades in a handbasket. I mean, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff going on in the world, terrible, and this is bad, and that's bad, you know, and if, you know, if this one don't get elected, and that don't get elected, and this doesn't happen, and this one, you know, that, and this and that, I want you to know the world is going to have tribulation, but I'm telling you, Jesus, it'd be of good cheer. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. I want, listen, as an American, as, as a citizen of America, I want godliness, and I want righteousness to reign, but I've been in unrighteous countries, and I've been in different places around the world, and I want you to know there are believers there who are living victorious, who are overcoming. You cannot wait and depend on the presidential election, the Senate election, the congressional election, this kind of election, this law to be passed, who's on the Supreme Court, who's not on the Supreme Court, to have your victory. Glory to God. Jesus has overcome the world. What's he mean the world? He's talking about the world system, the way things are done on the earth. He said when he told the disciples to pray that the will of the Father be on earth as it is in heaven. And glory to God. As a believer, you can have days of heaven on the earth. You can live victoriously. You can walk in the power of God. You can have the most liberal God. There's a bunch of people running everything all over the country. And, 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 and all kind of laws out there. And as a believer, glory to God, you can stand in your place as victorious and overcomer and say, it's not going to overtake me and my household. Glory to God. Amen. You stop getting depressed because you didn't like who got appointed to this court or got appointed to that court. You are victorious. You live victorious. Jesus is the Lord. Hallelujah. And He has overcome the world system. I grew up. I'm old enough. Uh, Dick's old enough. Bill's old enough. Benny's old enough. I'm not saying anything about Ellie. one. I remember growing up and watching the Stick your head under the desk in case of a nuclear attack. The fire station had, the schoolhouse had the little radioactive sign on the outside of the building. This is a safe place. They failed to show us Hiroshima and Nagasaki when they put it on the brick building. Because if you look at this, the atomic bomb, it leveled the schoolhouses and the fire station. But I remember growing up under the Cold War. I remember growing up thinking that at any moment we were going to have the Third World War and that we were going to have a nuclear, uh, nuclear war with Russia. Prophecy teachers were all teaching that Russia was going to come down, they're going to be, they're going to have, they're going to have explosions, and perfect heat's going to melt the earth, that the nuclear was going to, how it was going to do it. You know, if we've already got it figured out, it's probably not going to, how it's going to happen. Every time we think we've got to figure it out, that's probably not how it's going to happen. Well, the Lord showed me, hey, really? You're the only one he's stolen? Right. Anyway, I grew up under that. I grew up under the, we grew up under the constant fear. Now, and we always mad every four years at the Olympics. Because the Russians, or the Soviets, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, communism, had all the, you know, had Czechoslovakia and they had, you know, Poland, they had all these states, and they all operated under the banner of the, of the USSR. And they'd always run the Olympics, because all their athletes were professional. All, and you couldn't be a professional athlete and, and engage in the Olympics at the time. You gotta remember that. That's why the Miracle on Ice in 1981 went to the Olympics, where the Americans beat the Russians with such a big deal, because it was a bunch of college kids beating their professional hockey team. How many of you have to remember that? How many going, I didn't even learn that in history. <laughs> it's all the movie. We grew up, and so our, our older generation grew up under all of that, thinking it was, it was, it was going to, we were going to have war. The communism would never fall. There was no way for it to fall. There's nothing that could happen to make it happen. And we sat there and watched the Berlin Wall get kicked down. Because a man had guts enough to stand up and say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Ronnie. And they tore the wall down. And the whole Soviet Union went, boom, 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 boom. I've been in Estonia, northernmost of the Baltic states, the first Baltic state to secede from the Soviet Union. And I went about two years after they succeeded. Well, a year. A year, no, three years. Three years after they Two and a half years after they seceded from the Soviet Union. I'd been there with the big boulders already, the engraving of the date and everything on it. 
And here's how they, they declared they were going to succeed, and the Soviets sent their T-1 tanks to Poland to surround the city to prevent them from succeeding from the Soviet Union. Ken Cassett, who's been with us a number of times, was living as a missionary in Haida when the tanks came to his little city there in the middle of the country to go to Poland. And they surrounded it, and they sat out there, and the, the, the people in Poland, that's the capital, had taken the big earth movers and all that and blocked all the routes into the city. And the Soviets sat out there until they ran out of fuel. And then they got out of their tanks and started walking home. <laughs> and all the people in the city came out and gave them food, bread, eat, and stuff, you know. And that's, and it's just, but here's the thing. We lived our whole life thinking this could never happen. We never saw this happen. But let me tell you how it started. A guy named Mark Brzee started going into East Germany, holding me as a missionary. Mark, he's been with us a number of times. Mark started going in, and he got the East German pastors, the book from Brother Hagen, translated into German, The Authority of the Believer. And they started praying. And they said, the iron curtain's coming down. There'll be no bloodshed in our country. And there was none in Germany. Nobody, they didn't kill, they didn't assassinate leaders or anything. It just fell. So those East German pastors got to pray and believe in God. And, so, and uh, see, they've been under communism their whole life. They've, uh, they've grown up as communists. They've grown up under that system. And they were, there was an underground church. And then they, uh, some things started opening up a little bit. And they got in there with the Word of God. And all of a sudden, next thing is, East Germany declares, you know, it's a feast from the Soviet Union. Kicks the Iron Curtain down in Berlin. We got, you know, we grew up. The, you know, they had to have papers just to drive from West Germany to get to the capital of East Berlin was the, was the capital for West Germany. West Berlin was the capital for East Berlin. Then they get mixed up. You know? And, 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 and I had a friend who was in the Army, and he, he, lived, he lived in Berlin in the Army, and they would sit in the morning, and they would start running Voice of America up, and the Russians would come out with a little jamming software, and they would just run all day long, changing the frequencies back and forth, just to keep, up, keep ahead of the Russians. We did not see any way that would ever change. Just keep it in the I want our country to prosper. I want our country to be godly. And I want, you know, God. But I am telling you, do not you get depressed. Don't you get down. Don't you get upset. We are the church, and we win. I wonder if they thought they must have thought something when the persecution took place in the church. See, the church has gotten lethargic in America. We've gotten lazy in America. We've gotten you hypocritical in America. We're letting all kinds of junk into the church. And I'm telling you, and, and God, God is putting the church up. All that to say, even in the midst, you, you cannot depend on a, the government you think you should have to be a winner. That's not going to fix you. Why? Men. Politicians are men or women. Or they don't know. Okay. Politicians do what's in their best interest for them to get elected again. Now, I believe there are some godly people out there that actually do believe in what they're doing, but that's not the norm. Not anymore. Okay? So, you can't put your confidence in so and so getting elected, I can have peace. Jesus said, in the world, and we see, understand, that word world in the Greek refers to the world system. In the world system, you'll have peace. Now, I couldn't try to have peace. In the world system, you'll have tribulation, but here's the cheer. I'll overcome it. I'm saying all this. Now, that means don't pray about the election, don't vote, the, you know, in, in righteousness, don't vote the way you know, your heart leads you to do. When I'm telling you, you know, if you're following God, don't follow, you, don't follow your flesh, don't follow your mind, don't follow what you think in it for you. Follow what you believe God would have you do. Okay? But if, if the person that you don't want to win wins, you can have good cheer. Why? Because Jesus overcame that world system. I said Jesus overcame that world system. Amen. First John 4 4. Ye are of God and have overcome them. Why? First John 4 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. If you read the preceding verses, it talks about the spirit of the Antichrist. So all the cohorts, the workers of, dark, of darkness, all that you've overcome them. Why? Greater is he that is in you. Somebody shout. How many Carolina fans do I have in here? One? 
too? Were you afraid to admit it? I was shouting last night. Woo! Duke lost. Hallelujah! They beat Duke at Duke. Anyway, weirdest game I've ever seen. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, who's in the world? Satan, in whom the God of this world has blinded the mind. Satan is the God of this world, this world system. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You've overcome. Why? Because the one in you has overcome the world system. That means that whatever you encounter, whatever you come up against, whatever you face in this world system, the one that's in you has already overcome that glory to God. He's already defeated it. Hallelujah. We can live in victory over because our Master, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, the great and mighty one, the first, the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. He who was and is and is to come has already overcome glory to God. We can live victorious. We don't have to hunker down and hide, stick our head in the sand. Oh, Jesus, what are we going to do? Oh, Lord. Now, last time you had Republicans saying, so so wins, I'm leaving the country. This time you got Democrats that whisper saying, if so so wins, I'm leaving the country. I think if all those folks leave the country, might be better off. Anyway. Hello? And nobody left. But they said they were going to last time. I don't think anybody leave this time. They, you know. Although we're in the world, now remember, see, we got, we got to understand the Greek word makes reference primarily to primarily. To. What in the world? Primarily, that the world means world system, a world order. Okay, so greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world order. The earth is being run by principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, but you are the king. There is a system that though you're in the world, you're not of it. Now, what do we have that comparable to in the political realm? It's called diplomatic immunity. An ambassador can come here from Iran and be a nutbag terrorist and go out and ride around, drive 300 miles an hour on our roads, and the police pull him over, and he just pulls out his little diplomatic immunity thing and says, you can't do anything to me. He is, he has diplomatic immunity. These are weapons that, okay. They're in America, but they're not of America. Whoever is here as an ambassador operates under the flag of their nation. They get in their car, they ride down the road, they put their little flags on it, and then they ride down the road and the police can't stop. They, can't. they can pull them over, they can't do anything. There's nothing they can do for them. They're in violation of, of freedom. And although they're in America, they're not of America. They're not even subject to our laws. And we have the same thing with them. That's, 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 that's what's typically all over the world. We do the same thing in their country. Our guys are, our guys are, are, are free from prosecution in their country because they're under diplomatic immunity. They're in the country, they're not of it. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. What does that mean? Well, that means that wherever Satan and his cohort, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, have spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, when they're trying to enforce things from this world on you, they don't have the authority. Now, the only way a diplomat or an ambassador can be prosecuted or whatever is if they forego or they abdicate themselves from their diplomatic immunity. And that's what Satan does or tries to do to you all the time. Revelation, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping, but you know, I'm working for out of it. Revelation 12, 9, And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Satan's way, Satan's method, the way he is able to defeat you is to deceive you. Into what? By the words of your mouth, advocating your diplomatic immunity because you're in this world, but you're not of this world. Well, how do I do that? 
by saying what he says instead of what God says. I'm not going to live much money. I ain't got no money. What are you doing? You are foregoing your diplomatic community for the world to be enforced on you. You have verbally given your consent for the system of this world to overtake you. And you, though you're in it, and you're, and although you're not of it, because you for you relinquished your right to your immunity from the world system, now it can overtake you. Now I hear a bunch of rusty gears out there. Because you're really thinking right now. See, you've always thought that's just the way it has to be. Satan deceives you into giving up your right to keep him from enforcing the world system on you by your words and by your actions. Your words and your actions. Some of your words start to do it. And he will clean your clock. But here's the beautiful thing. At any point in time during the process, you can reestablish your diplomatic immunity with your words. And stop it. I said, you can stop it. And the God of this world has to bow his knee to the greater one. Oh, if we could see things the way heaven if we could see, if we could just see, you know, even get a glimpse. The Bible tells us that when Satan is cast into the pit, that we will stand and say, Is this he who calls the nations to tremble? And it's a little Wizard of Oz with a little machine out there. How many have seen the Wizard of Oz? How many have never seen the Wizard of Oz right there? Come on. Come on. You've never, never seen it. Anybody over here never seen the Wizard of Oz? You're acting sheepishly. Have you seen it? Several times. Look, look, kind of look like mm-hmm. Well, the little wizard sits out there, and he's got his little machine, makes all these things happen, and they're all afraid. Of it, and then you find out who he is, and they're like, "You got to be kidding me!" He must convince little weeny five little grumpy old man. We've been running and all this stuff and hiding and all upset because of the little old man. No, nope. see, that's how the devil is. We're going we're gonna to stay and stand in amazement and say, is this he that caused the nations to tremble? And how did he cause them to tremble? He used deception. What did the wizard of Oz do? He used a little machine to deceive them and think that things were worse than they really were. And Satan is constantly badgering you, trying to make you believe it's worse than you think it is. I mean, then it really is. Make you think it is. Why? Because he'll get you deceived and get you to what do what? Get you to relinquish your immunity from his authority by speaking things that give him the authority. That's why the psalmist said, put a watch over my mouth that I might not sin in it. Amen? Jesus is called the high priest of our profession. Same Greek word as confession. He's called the high priest of our confession. That's called confession of faith. You believe what you say. Amen? And if you don't believe it, it won't work. Now, there's a lot of people who believe that the devil... That's how they act when they their authority. They get to believe in what the devil's saying more true than what God says. And they believe the lies from the devil that God don't do that anymore. God don't heal anymore. God don't deliver anymore. God doesn't bless anymore. God doesn't do this anymore. And they get to believe in that. They get deceived. And some theologian comes along and says, well, we've done a study, and uh, we found out from the, uh, the, uh, the former text that, you know, the day the last apostle died, God stopped doing this. And you can't find that in the text. They just made that up. They took one passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. But they didn't read the rest of that where Paul said, you know, in that time, when that which is perfect is come, I'll know even as I am known. And they said, that's the kind of the Scripture. I don't know even as I am known. I've read the Bible. I still don't know even as I am known. John says when he'll appear, we'll, know, we'll be like him for we see him as he is. It's when the appearing of the Lord takes place. We'll know even as we're known. Not until. But we get deceived into believing that God don't do that anymore. He doesn't heal. 
As a matter of fact, we get to see the believe God wouldn't put it on you in the first place. So he's trying to keep the something. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, that, not just that he don't do it, that he doesn't heal anymore. He's the one putting it on you. Yeah! May he gave you age. No. We don't even need to go into that, do we? Gave you uh, sexually transmitted diseases. The Lord put that. No, the Lord didn't put that on you. As a matter of fact, if you had listened to the Lord, you wouldn't have it or ever had it. What do you mean? You kept yourself pure until you got married, and everybody keeps themselves pure until they got married. You don't get it. You don't get sexually transmitted diseases if you ain't having sex. That's simple. Not real complicated. Hello? I mean, that just isn't hard to figure out, is it? Come on. You can't get, you know, well, blood turns. Uh, okay. okay. If people weren't doing it and getting into the blood and then they go get given blood, it wouldn't be in the blood supply. I get that. Okay. I'm somebody who pulls out that extreme case, you know, and go through a blood transfusion. But the people who gave the blood weren't engaging in sex, they wouldn't have been diseased and they wouldn't have given blood with that stuff in it. In other words, if everybody gave a blood step from the beginning, we wouldn't have any trouble at all. So God's not putting something on you. Come on. God's not the one labeling that and putting that stuff on people. Lifestyle puts on. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm just going to look right straight ahead at Dick. All right, and Joe. Joe and Dick right there, right in my straight line eyesight. Got, you know, get, Joe, where'd you get that shirt, man? You can have a look at Joe's shirt. He wants your shirt. Okay. Now stop here. Let's, let's stop here for a second. Yeah, y'all, y'all just wait till later. See, we got people preaching that God's making you sick. God's causing calamity to take place. God's killing your loved ones. God's running over grandmoms with a Mack truck so you had to bury her and all this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, the dog, you know, he, he killed your dog and had the neighbors through the air through your backyard and killed your dog, your favorite dog in the backyard. God had a reason for doing all that. And then, they, and then you know, and, and, and you got people for even staying and preaching that if you know, somebody gets killed, that's the devil doing that. That's the devil for Really? What is that called? So we we run people away from the things of God. Feel pastors do it, ministers do it all the time, because we're not preaching truth. Or we're only preaching a side of the truth that we like. We won't preach the stuff we don't like. You gotta preach the stuff we don't like. You gotta preach truth whether you like it or not. You gotta say what the Bible says whether you like it or not. But I don't like that. It's tough. Then stop preaching. If you can't preach the stuff that goes cross grain to what you like in its Bible, then you shouldn't be preaching. Because the Word's final authority. Okay. Now, what time is it? No, oh, I've got another half hour. I'm just getting warmed up. So you think, oh, dear Jesus, He can't be true. Look at Romans 8. So we're born to overcome. God designed us that way, Romans 8. We're not going to finish this morning. I, I can't finish. I, well, I could, but I would, I would leave stuff out I don't need to leave out. Look at verse 30. Uh, verse 30, 29. For whom he did foreknow. Everybody should underline that word foreknow. The doctrine of predestination cannot exist outside the doctrine of foreknowledge. Chapter 29. For whom he did foreknow. Now, I've got a lot, I know a lot of people who believe in their, 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 their extreme Calvinists, and, and it's just way off. You know, God made, if you're a prostitute, God made you a prostitute, so he can show you his, 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 his uh, mercy and love, whatever. I mean, God made you a murderer, so he can show you mercy and love. Or there's a reason you're going to be a murderer, you're just going to go to hell. If you kill somebody that was close to somebody that caused that person to get saved, that's just, they're this crazy stuff. No, he says here, the doctrine of predestination has to be based on God's foreknowledge. Why? Because it says, for whom he did foreknows, he also did. He also did predestinate. Predestinate takes place because of foreknowledge. What does he mean foreknowledge? He knew who would get set through this. He knew who would come to know who would get set. And those who came, he knew, he knew, would accept the redeemer of redemption who predestinated them. They become God's elect. But it's through foreknowledge and not sovereignty. 
sovereignty says, you're getting saved, you're going to hell. And you're getting saved. Why did I choose Melanie? Because she's been talking to bust on me back this week. Come on, come on, Melanie. Come on, Melanie. Give it right. Come on. Pop, pop it up there. All right. Maybe she'll get that bus off me today. But see, that's that. See, people believe in free guests, things like that. God just comes by and goes, oh, you're saved. You're not. You are. You're, you know, just kind of just picked out. And, and those are going and, and those are going to say, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to get saved. No, 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 no. God looked out through time and saw all the deals except Jesus. And because all of them accept Jesus, He predestinated them to be conformed to the image of His Son. Why? Because He knew they would, and because they would, He didn't have a plan for that. He didn't predestinate somebody to go to hell. How do you know? He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, if you take those extremes in your teaching or your belief system, then that means everybody's going to be saved because God's not willing that any should be lost. No, that's not what it means. His will is nobody be lost. Reality is, people go to hell. Because they reject what he offers, he made it available. You can leave earth, you can leave a horse to water, you can't make him drink. You can leave a human to cows, but you can't make him accept. They have to receive because they want to, because they believe that Jesus is the Son of God and they accept His lordship. Amen. All right, moving right along here. For whom He did foreknow, He did predestinate, that He conform to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, He also called. Whom He called, He justified. Whom He justified, He also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, you can dance over there. Come on. You can do that I mean, you can just grab a hold of the and just stand here and rest if God be for us, who can be against us? In other words, what can Satan do to you if God's for you? What can he bring your way that's going to take you down when the greater one on the inside will rise up, hallelujah, and defeat the works of the enemy? For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Glory to God. Come on now. So God be for us. Who can be against us? Satan can bring everything. And you just stand there and just laugh. Hallelujah. You laugh in the face of danger. You laugh in the face of the enemy because God's on my side. And me and God win. Why? These things that I've done, you might have peace. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Come on now. I have overcome the world. And then John picked up on that and said, And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Glory to God. And if he's in you and he's overcome, that means when Satan brings stuff to defeat you, it's already been defeated. Glory to God. And you stand up and take your place as a believer. You exercise your faith and you win. I said you win. One guy said one time, he said, man, when you're going through hell, don't stop. He said some Christians get out and have a picnic lunch, put a tent up, and just camp out there, and just whine and complain about how bad it is. No, we just keep going, and we keep going. Why? Because we're going to come out on the other side. Jesus, when he faced the cross, the Bible says, who for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He looked on the other side and saw the victory. He looked on the other side and saw where he won. He looked on the other side and saw that he pleased the Father, glory to God. So he kept going. He went to the cross. He was crucified. He was buried, but he was resurrected and came out on the other side, glory to God. Don't quit. Don't give up. Keep going with Jesus. You win. How did I'm preaching better than you're shouting. My God. Quit quitting. Keep going. I said, don't quit. Keep going. Hallelujah. Y'all don't help me out here. I'm going to run by myself. Look at 1 Corinthians 1557. We're going to wrap it up here. 
in both of the we've got two scriptures, one from the first book. <coughs> Paul writing to the church of Corinth. First Corinthians fifteen. Looking down here. Look at verse fifty. Now I say this, brother, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the light. And I said, well, I want to see you. No, you just want you guys to understand now. Hello? In the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the dead, for the trump shall stand, the dead and Christ, the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, and we shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up. Death is swallowed up. I said death is swallowed up in what? Victory. The believer, ooh, you got loved ones that have gone home? You got people you love that, that are in heaven right now? They got, they, their death got swallowed up in victory. I said their death got swallowed up in victory. Yeah, we grieve when we lose them, but you know what? We don't have to grieve too long because their death got swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy victory? Oh, brave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks to you, God. It's a button, but. Be, be like a goat, a billy goat. But, but, all these button stuff. We need to be Billy Goat Christians. Just butt the devil. When the devil says something, butt him. I said just butt him. With what? The word. The thanks be to God. Which give us us to our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh my. Not because you got a better job. Not because the right person got elected. Not because you got a new house. Not because you got a new car. All those things. And God don't care if you have those things in life. But if they're your victory, you miss the mark. Because your mark, your place of victory is in Jesus. Let's get, now go over to 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, chapter 2. <laughs> yeah, so in his Bible, next page. 9 and 2. Now, thanks be to God. Notice Paul keeps thanking God for something. Now, let me tell you something, folks. Paul was not some silver spoon born dude. Well, he, he, was, he was born a free Roman. He, he, he talked about all the stuff he went through. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was, he was stoned. I mean, I mean, he was left for dead. All kinds of stuff happened to him. Perils in the city, perils in the country, perils of his own countrymen. I mean, you know, I mean, just come back. You know, you're talking about the Bible says he's blessed in the city, blessed in the country. He was in perils. And yet, he writes to the church at Corinth and says, Now, thanks be to God. You've got to get back to the place where you can, in the midst of your circumstance, go, Thanks be to God! Why, Paul? Which always. Which always. Which always. What does God always do? Causes us to triumph. Woo! Come on now. Always causes us to triumph. Where? In Christ. The word Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ is what Jesus is. The word Christ comes from the Greek Christos, which is the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew Hamashiach. We translate Hamashiach Messiah. Jesus in the Old Covenant was known as Yeshua Hamashiach. Okay? This is the word for Joshua. Yeshua is Joshua. Okay? Jesus is the Greek form. So when we say Jesus Christ, it's not first and last name. The word Christos, the word Hamashiach, Messiah, both mean the anointed one. We, are, we overcome... Through Jesus, the anointed one. What did Isaiah say? I believe Isaiah 57, 11 or something like that. Does anybody remember what else? The yoke shall be destroyed, 
and the burden removed because of the anointing. So the anointing is the yoke destroying, burden removing power of God. Jesus is the anointed one. What's that? He's got the yoke destroying, burden removing power of God on, in, and through him. And he lives in you. So when you call on Jesus, the yoke, what, what is a yoke? Y'all, y'all, you guys know enough about farming, you know what a yoke is. Beast of burden are yoked together. They put a yoke on two horses, a team of horses, a team of mules, different things. Team of, yeah, team of mules. I used to truck the back of sometimes, you had a mule there, the ag there. Anyway. I was at 1027, thank you. I was at 1027. But whatever one mule does, the other one does. Whatever two oxen do, one of them does it, the other one does it. Why? Because they're yoked together. They have to walk in harmony. It's that, that, it's that farm implement that's going around the next and now both of them. And if one stops, the other one has to stop. Or walk around in a circle. They drag the other one. Now, Isaiah says that the anointing will destroy the yoke. See, you've been yoked in the past in sin. You've been yoked in captivity to bondage, oppression, depression, suppression. You know, you've been yoked to uh, mental thoughts. You've been yoked to deception of the devil. You've been yoked to all kinds of things that Satan's tried to put on you. But now, thanks to God, was always called me out. He's a triumph. He didn't say he'd be a bunch of whiners. I mean, some Christians who just need people block a cheese at the back of the church. You want a little cheese with that wine? Because that's all you're doing is whining. Hello? But we don't believe in drinking, so we don't do that. Anyway, come lighten up. Sheesh. But he always, what does he do? He comes and he just destroys the thing that you're yoked. He destroys the yoke that's holding you in the captivity. He breaks it. What's that mean? You're now free to go however you want to go. You're no longer yoked to sin. You're no longer yoked to captivity. You're no longer yoked to bondage. You're no longer yoked to Satan's authority. You're no longer yoked to depression or suppression or oppression. You're no longer yoked to all these financial issues. You've now had that destroyed. And it's this. And the burden you lose. You don't have to carry the weight of it anymore. And here's the good news. Then Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor in a heavy lady. What happens? He destroys the yoke, removes the burden, and says, Now hook up with me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now what's he going to do? We'll go to the 23rd Psalm. Let's, get, let's kind of get an idea of what the Lord's thinking when you hook up with him. The, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. It don't do you any good to go to a class 10 white water river and be camping beside you. You can't even get any water out of it without getting pulled in. Now, I've been at Niagara Falls on the, uh, um, on the uh, Canadian side. You know, and over there, you can walk right up to the edge. You see, you know, you have a well. You can just see it. And 20 feet down, it goes over the falls. And that water is running. I bet it looks like 100 miles an hour running by you. You stick your hand in, I pull you in. All right, no, I, that, well, I went down without anything. I'm jacked now. All right, now, the, the waterfall didn't dare mess with me. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his potential. Yea, though I walk through this and this. You don't have to walk through death. He says you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For thy heart is good. Thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Can you think of it? Here's the devil there trying to bust your chops. Trying to take you down. 
and the Lord has sits you down at a table, and He comes out, hallelujah, while you're sitting there, and on that table is everything you have needed. There's a bowl of healing, and there's a bowl of prosperity. And there's a bowl of, of overcoming. And there's a bowl of soundness of mind. And you sit down there and say, Hey, pass me the bowl of healing. Go be to God. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemy. The devil's watching. You slap him. I mean, slap that healing on your plate. Kind of like one of our home country meals. Pass the rutabaga. Pass the collard green. Pass the mashed potatoes and the fried chicken. Go be to God. Pass the homemade buttermilk lard filled biscuits. Go be to God. Somebody shouting you. Take that old country meat and stick in the pot and boil it for half an hour, then put the collard greens in it. And let them cook till they tend to get all that flavor down in them. And God prepares a table for you. It may not be collard greens, but it's human. It's prosperity. It's deliverance. It's whatever you have need of to win the battle and to overcome. God has put on the table for you. And you just sit right down in the presence of your enemy. Why? Because he's got to sit. You anoint my head with oil. What is it? I mean, they come every day. They just, they just touch me. I mean, are we, are we Christians, we, we do a little, we do fleece and anoint with oil. A little dab will do you. Now, that's, you know, people get real scared and they toss out of the oil. I mean, they come they took that thing and just poured it over your head. And it just ran down and saturated you. And God saturated you. My cup runs over. Now, when I go to a restaurant, I keep the waitress with me. I drink. A I, I, that's when I drink most. I know, y'all supposed to do that. I don't care. I do it. Finally, finally, you, know, you should bring pictures. You can't bring pictures to the table anymore. They, don't let them bring, they say it's helpful. No, it's just you don't want to watch the pictures. It really is. They just don't want to watch the pictures. You got to have enough to go to the table and have extra stuff to keep watching the pictures. So they just say they can't do it. Anyway, and, you know, I used to work in restaurants. I know. There's some restaurants you go to, they still do it. So it's not a, it's not a help code, it's your lazy code. Anyway, so I, say, I find that look. Bring me an extra glass and fill it up. Make my glass to be full, like, full of tea with ice in it. With no ice in the oven, and I'll just keep using it as a refill until it runs out. Then you can come out and fill that one back up. You know, because it'll save you about six trips. Hello. Well, I'm going to wave you down every two seconds. All right? My cup runs over. I believe in having an overrunning cup. You? Amen? Hallelujah. Listen to this. Here's the three angels. Surely, goodness, and mercy. They follow you. Wait a minute. Who follows you around? Surely, goodness, and mercy. No. It's a different story. I know that. But surely, of an assurance. There's no doubting that this is true. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. They're following you around, looking for an opportunity to just jump on you. Now, when, when I was younger, no, when, I was younger I was when Shannon was younger, and at our other house, when I was younger too, we had a staircase came down the middle, and the last four treads is where the handrails came out, and you know, the rest of the, the rest of the staircase was, was walled. Those last four treads, you know, it, it opened up and had the you know the deck of the you know, stuff now, and that kind of stuff. Well, Shannon used to hide up there. Now, between there and the front door, on one side was the family room, the other side was the dining room. And I did a lot of work in the dining room because I didn't have an office at that time. Uh, and so I would walk back and forth, and she'd hide up there, and as I come through, she'd jump on me. I mean, I'd just walk, I'd walk around paper or something, she'd just jump on me. It's just one of her games she would do. She didn't change the whole lot. Anyway. She's 26 almost, but she still likes to jump on Dad. She would jump on me. Now, one day I walked by there, and I was really concentrating on something. I had my head uh, like this. And I, and I kind of, out of my pussy, saw something do. And I heard it go splat. <laughs> sure, goodness and mercy of an assurance. I am telling you with a, with a steadfast assurance right now. Mercy and goodness are following me. They're waiting to jump. Are you here? They're looking for an opportunity to take you down and bless you 
And I'm telling you, goodness and mercy are just hiding, waiting to jump. So do you get blessed? I will dwell in the house of the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.